good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the already fourth Euro practice webinar on microfluidics. Today, we continue with more knowledge sharing on the available manufacturing solutions for microfluidic devices. After the first part in which fabrication methods were introduced, we resume today with more microfluidic technologies, standards, and also hybrid solutions for lab workflow automation. This work will be presented by Mark Olde Riekering of Micronit Microtechnologies. Marek received his PhD degree in polymer chemistry and biomaterials research at the University of Twente in Enschede, the Netherlands in 2001. From then on to 2007, he has been working at Philips Corporate R&D Center in several semiconductor and healthcare related projects. In 2007, he started working for Micronit as an R&D project manager. Since then, he has been mainly involved in the development of lab-on-a-chip microfluidic devices for life science applications. Currently, he is Senior Business Development Manager and is focusing on product developments in application areas like DNA sequencing and single cell analysis. With this, we are ready to start for another insightful session. Marek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Reed, uh, for this kind introduction. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining this webinar. My name is Mark Olderiekerink. I'm a Senior Business Development Manager at Micronit Microtechnologies. And I'm happy to present to you, to the, to you today about microfluidic technologies, standards, hybrid solutions for lab workflow automation. Let me start uh, with the contents of this webinar for today. I have split the presentation in a few topics. Uh, first, I would like to start with an introduction about trends, materials, and technologies in the microfluidics field. Then I will continue uh, to talk a bit more about interfacing and standardization. Following uh, integration of microfluidic uh, functions, which is very relevant if you want to create devices with an automated workflow. Then I'll continue with discussing a bit more in detail the technical aspects of various bonding technologies that we use to bond different materials together, which we call hybrid bonding technologies. And finally, following up on those bonding technologies, I'd like to share with you some examples of hybrid solutions for lab workflow automation, which brings me then to the end of the webinar and allows you to raise some questions. So let me start with the introduction on what we see happening in the microfluidics market today. A number of trends, uh, trends we see uh, happening in the market. Uh, I will go through them, uh, not uh, everyone in uh, each detail, but uh, the general trends we see are that uh, making microfluidic devices, making products uh, for life science and diagnostic applications means that we have to work towards an automated lab workflow, as we call it. Uh, you do not want to have too much manual handling. You do not want to use too much reagent volumes. Uh, you would really like to automize and reduce the cost of the test and uh, speed up the time you need for doing a test. And some of the other trends mentioned in this slide are coupled to that. For example, sample to answer, which is a really a trend in the in vitro diagnostics and point of care field. Having a sample, for example, saliva or blood or urine and measuring that in a cartridge within a few minutes to get your result. In the high-end life science, we also see a trend uh, towards high content and high throughput. Uh, more data are being generated, for example, in DNA sequencing uh, by using state-of-the-art technologies uh, in that field. And this has uh, tremendously accelerated that field uh, of research and also moving towards medical diagnostics. And also we see that uh, to, to make that happen, we not only need microfluidic components, we need to integrate IC technology. And this is, I think, a nice link to this uh, webinar for today really where semicon meets microfluidics. Finally, we see, and I think uh, with the actual situation around COVID-19, that's good to mention, high throughput, the need for high throughput. Uh, there's tests on the market, but preferably would like to be able to do a, a large range of tests in a very short time. So you need to generate mechanisms for that uh, in order to create a high throughput. 
let me continue uh, with uh, showing what happens if these trends uh, would be reflected in terms of how to, to deal with that in, in technology. Basically, you could see this, this triangle, as we call it, if you bring the microfluidics expertise together with the MEMS and Semicon expertise, you can create more functionalities and also work towards diversification and integration. And if you do that and you combine these technologies together, you can create systems with a higher value that will result in an advanced lab on a chip system. And that's really, I think, the key message for today's webinar. We're not just discussing microfluidic solutions. We'd like to discuss solutions that create a higher value uh, to the market, to the life science and diagnostics market. To continue with the materials, I would like to say that basically there are a, a number of groups of materials. I already mentioned them briefly. Uh, let's start with glass. Glass is a commonly used material in microfluidics based solutions, especially if you look at life science, the more high end life science applications. Typically, the types of glass that are used are borosilicate glass like T263, Mempex, or Eagle XG glass, but also more high end pure glasses like fused silica are commonly used in this industry because of their uh, superior optical properties and low autofluorescence. If we then look at silicon, we're not just talking about only plain silicon wafers, uh, single side and double side polish, but also about the more advanced uh, silicon wafer systems like silicon on insulator, uh, wafers with silicon oxide and silicon nitride layers for masking. But uh, we also clearly see a trend towards things like piezoelectrics, where uh, piezoelectric layers are integrated into a silicon device uh, to create uh, more MEMS functionality, uh, which can then be integrated into the microfluidic system as well. And then a third group, the polymers, uh, we, I, I would also briefly like to touch upon. Um, we see uh, various polymers uh, entering the microfluidics market. I think the four mentioned here are the, the main groups of polymers that are used currently for applications in life science and diagnostics, which are, let's say, from the high end to the low end, uh, COC and COP, cyclic olefin polymers, polycarbonate, which is a, a polymer well known from the media industry, uh, CDs and DVDs are made out of that material. Um, then we have polystyrene, which is commonly used for cell culturing applications. And if you talk about prototyping and more the low end materials, uh, you, uh, you end up with acrylic materials like PMMA. So as said, these are the three groups of materials, but more importantly, I would say that if you can combine these materials together, uh, whether it's a glass silicon device or a silicon polymer device, or maybe even a device uh, consisting of all three materials, this is what we call a hybrid solution. And we strongly believe that creating those hybrid solutions will enable systems with a higher value. And that's also what I would like to address in the examples later on in this webinar. So as said, if you bring these materials together into a, a more advanced system, the challenge will be to find the right assembly and bonding technologies to create these hybrid devices uh, and create the functionality that you need. So some, some technologies that are used in this field. Um, to start with, this list is certainly not uh, comprehensive. It just shows some of the main processes used in the industry. And also here I made a split between glass and silicon materials and polymer materials because the fabrication technologies to make devices out of these materials is quite different. Glass and silicon use quite, uh, let's say, uh, overlapping technologies coming from the semicon industry. Lithography based processing, for example, etching techniques, both wet etching, which is commonly used for glass, as well as dry etching, which is commonly used for silicon. Then there is a range of deposition techniques possible, uh, whether it's a metal layer that needs to be deposited on the surface or some kind of silicon oxide or silicon nitride layer. Uh, so there's a range of, of, of uh, processes um, uh, that are available from the semicon industry to use for the microfabrication of glass and silicon. One of the most important steps, obviously, and I'll come back to that in more detail in the, in the second part of the talk, is bonding technology. Um, bonding a silicon to a silicon or bonding a glass to a glass is, is quite mature and straightforward, but bonding different materials together is, is where we really create value 
and these are uh, this is an area where there's a lot of growth in terms of uh, new technologies uh, popping up. Then looking at the polymer materials, as said, we need quite different fabrication techniques for that. Usually there you talk, uh, when you talk about high volume manufacturing, injection molding is the way to go. Uh, you replicate uh, at high numbers once you've created a high quality mold. But also for lower volumes and medium volumes, there's techniques available like hot embossing, which is a nice replication technique, and micro milling, which gives you the flexibility if you only need small numbers of prototypes to quickly act and create uh, rapid learn uh, learning cycles rather than having to invest in a mold first and finding out later that the design was, was not okay. So there's multiple replication techniques available uh, to create a polymer device. And also here, the trick is in the bonding. How do you bond these layers together to make a closed chip that works in an aut autonomous way? Finally, there's a group of processes that you could call backend processing, where once the layers are microstructured and brought together and bonded, you need a number of, of elements to create functionalities and to create value for the, for the solution. And you could think of uh, coatings, these could be chemical coatings, these could be biological coatings, reagent deposition, which can either be done after bonding or prior to bonding, depending on the, the, the route that is chosen, uh, hybrid assemblies, uh, for example, adding a sensor or adding some kind of package or valve to the uh, chip. Uh, flip chip bonding, a common technique, of course, from the semicon industry, uh, which you can use also for microfluidic devices uh, to, to integrate your sensor in, uh, into your microfluidic package. And also there I have some examples later on. And then finally, you need to dice or separate your product and package it in a proper way. So these are all considered to be backend processes that you need uh, to create your, uh, your product. So let me continue then with the topic of microfluidic interfacing and standardization. Now, if we look at the microfluidics industry, we see signs of matures. And clearly the investments are becoming more seriously with a shift from point of care to medical diagnostics. And this actually automatically means that higher investments are involved and that the number of investments per round are uh, more serious. So the money is growing and this means we have to start seriously thinking about how to consolidate in the supply chain and how to cooperate between companies. And you could really say that the driving force for standards in, uh, in, in the industry is created by the market itself. And that's also why standardization is relevant and why we should look at guidelines and standards uh, to create a medical device from a microfluidic product. Now, let me continue saying uh, in general, uh, if we look at standards, why should we care about it? It's, it's a general question to ask, but there's a number of answers, obviously. You could think of, if we look at uh, medical devices, for example, you care about what is implanted in your body or what kind of medication you need to take. Or if you do a diagnostic test, of course, you would like to have a reliable test and know that the result is actually, uh, well, the result it should be. Also, cost uh, is, uh, is always an important factor, but I think bottom line, uh, maybe even more important than cost, is we care about safety and quality. So looking at a diagnostic or a medical device, we want it to be safe and we want it to have the right quality so it re uh, delivers a reliable result. Now, if we look at the definition of standardization coming from the Commission of the European Communities, um, I'm not going to read out the definition. Uh, you can see it on the slide, but I think there's some key words to add here. First of all, it's all about cooperation, voluntary cooperation in the industry between consumers, between public authorities, between suppliers, and it's based on consensus. If there's no consensus on specifications or requirements for a medical device, it's hard to start a standardization uh, process. Secondly, um, if you standardize, it needs to be interoperable. So interoperability is really key. Uh, otherwise, there's no complementary uh, uh, driving force there. And companies can cooperate, but if there's no exchange between, uh, let's say, uh, connectors, for example, or interfacing uh, solutions, it, it's still an isolated uh, yeah, uh, product, and you cannot uh, use it for other, for other um, uh, systems. 
and they're also looking at test method, uh, methods and the requirements for safety and health are uh, really relevant. So here, uh, clearly stated, standardization requires cooperation between companies and it also requires an interoperable solution. Now, what are the benefits for standardization? Some, I think I already mentioned, uh, benefits uh, with aspects like communication, uh, standard me uh, measurement procedures, and that has already also been discussed in the previous uh, webinar, manufacturing and commerce. But at the end, you could say, let's focus on, on the economic benefits. Why should we standard uh, standardize? Um, well, we want to facilitate business interaction uh, and also, also comply to the regulations out there, especially looking at, at medical device development. And secondly, and I think maybe even more importantly, standardization will enable a speeding up uh, of introduction of new products to the market. Uh, if you use standardized solutions, your time to market will become shorter. I think that's really a key message uh, to learn here. And also it ensures the compatibility between products uh, from different companies. That's referring to the interoperability I just mentioned in the, in the definition. But there are challenges, obviously, especially if we look at the microfluidics field. Each life science application is based on a different kind of technology, sensing technology. Each company has its own IP and there's patent restrictions. So companies need to work around uh, patents if you talk about production schemes, if you talk about integrating of uh, integration of technologies. And we really need to understand the needs of our customers. As a microfluidic developer, uh, a customer comes to us and says, well, we have an essay or a test and we want to make it uh, transfer uh, into a microfluidic product. You have to translate those requirements and needs into a real product, into deliverables. And that's a challenge in itself. And then last, but certainly not least, there's always the aspect of time pressure. Companies want to hit the market, they want to move fast, and they need rapid prototypes. But creating a rapid prototype doesn't always mean you're able to scale up. That's a different thing. So you need ability to scale up and you need a cost efficient process. And for that, standardization will obviously help a lot. Now I've um, uh, taken two examples uh, from the semicon industry um, provided by uh, Mr. Feplan from CA Leti uh, that show nicely the link uh, to what we are talking uh, about in terms of interfacing. Uh, here you see a classic, uh, I would say, connector solution uh, coming from the uh, semicon industry, USBs. Uh, and why do I use this example? Because I want to stress that standardization does not mean you need one unique format, which is the same always. It can be different connectors, but if you standardize the protocols and you have uh, a number of, of products uh, which makes it uh, interoperable and interchangeable, it's still a standardized product, as you can see with the USB connector. There's many variations there, but they're all standardized and can be used for specific equipment all around the world. The second example, also coming from the microelectronics, is obviously the PCB the motherboard uh, in computers, in smartphones. Basically, you can create a, mod, uh, a motherboard with modules mounted on top of that that are all standardized. So if you want to create a new generation of motherboard, you're not going to design and develop all components individually. Again, you have your, your toolbox of microcontrollers and resistors and capacitors, and you want to combine them in such a way that you can create a new product instead of having to go through customization of each module uh, every time. So I think we can learn a lot from that. And you'll see also in some of the examples later on that uh, we're going to discuss about fluidic connection boards, for example. Now, if we uh, look at the timeline of uh, creating uh, interfacing standards in the microfluidics industry, uh, this is a, a rough sketch. Uh, going uh, back in time about a decade ago, uh, companies uh, were using interfacing uh, solutions, each being unique for their own components, uh, sold as, as off-the-shelf components, but for their specific format. So very much company specific. And that will not work if you want to standardize globally. So you need some kind of cooperation there uh, between uh, companies. And that's where the MFM project came in, a big project that ran for four years, uh, in uh, starting in 2014 
where companies decided and also institutes and, and universities to work towards a more common standard in terms of interfacing. And this has now resulted uh, recently uh, last year in the uh, foundation of the Microfluidics Association, where these companies work together, companies from industry, uh, but as I said, also institutes and universities, regulatory uh, companies, to create uh, an international organization that works towards ISO standards, uh, protocols, measurement protocols, uh, and uh, all the things needed to uh, make sure that standardization is taken seriously in the microfluidics development. And looking at the future, uh, focus areas are reliability and scalability. I mentioned that already uh, in the previous slides. And also to create complex microfluidics systems that are qualified and that have a reliable and even predictable result. Now, if you again make the link to the uh, to the semicon uh, microelectronics industry and you look at, the, the, for example, the timeline of, of creating an integrated circuit, uh, a processor for a computer, uh, you can see how it all started. And if you follow that line, you could say that today microfluidics compared to, let's say, what has happened in microelectronics is a, a motherboard with a spider assembly. All the different components are arbitrarily uh, used and connected, but there's no real uh, standardization there. And we would really like to work towards the next maturity stage in creating more uniformity, as you can see in the pictures uh, that are uh, encircled. And then ultimately, if that is standardized, if you have your components that are standardized, you would like to work towards system solutions. But there's a way to go, and we're certainly not there yet. Now, looking at standardization from a system level, you could say there's basically four levels. Starting at the top, level zero, you need to start standardizing your design components. So really, microfluidic components inside your chip can be standardized. And then if you have uh, reached that level, you can continue towards building microfluidic uh, building blocks in the next step. And these building blocks, uh, whether it's a chip or whether it's the clamp unit or the circuit board, should be standardized as well. If that's the case, you can start building your product or your consumable uh, uh, modular based on a fluidic circuit board or using standard interfacing techniques that can then be connected to your system. So every step taken brings you closer to a standardized system. And if you have standardized these levels, then you're ready to start designing a reliable system that becomes predictable as well because you're using standardized components. So it's much easier to develop a system that creates a reliable result. Now, let me switch uh, finally to some of the interfacing solutions that are out there today and that are also the topic of standardization within the MFA uh, platform. Uh, we distinguish between two kinds of connections if you talk about microfluidics uh, connected to the outside world. The first one is top-down. That's the most classical approach uh, known in industry already for quite some time, which basically means you have an easy access on a flat top surface and it can be smoothly sealed towards the vias or the through holes uh, in the chip. But you need relative large areas uh, for sealing. Uh, Top-down connectors uh, are widely available in many different sizes and, 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 and types. And uh, also the advantage for, for this kind of uh, connection is that you enable stacking of microfluidic devices. So multiple layers or components, uh, even sensors, can be uh, mounted on top of each other. And you see an example in the picture uh, at, the, at the right. Then the second type of interfacing known in the industry, uh, we call it side connect. It's also known as edge connect, meaning that you basically have an in-plane connection to your microfluidic device, as you can see in the schematic below. This enables a smooth access and entrance to the microfluidic channels. And uh, very importantly, especially if you look at applications with using cells and droplets, there's a limited flow disruption because you're working in plane. Also an advantage there is that there is uh, much less dead volume uh, at the interfacing uh, areas. And there's an easy access possible from the top because your top surface is completely flat and clean and you could enter or access with a microscope or some kind of uh, fluorescent uh, detector in an easy way because there's no interference with tubing or things like that. This also enables a reduced footprint of your chip because the in-plane uh, connectors uh, avoid uh, using footprint on the top of your chip. 
Now, here are some examples of these Edge Connect connectors coming from the industry, the suppliers in the field. Uh, also, this list is not comprehensive. It's just to show you that there's multiple solutions uh, and I, I have to say unique solutions in the market. And this also brings me back to my previous point. Still, these are very much company specific solutions that are not interoperable. And we should really work towards standardization to make these kind of solutions interoperable between companies and to make it easier for our customers to design a microfluidic chip and buy some kind of interface and connect at company A or B. Uh, it doesn't really matter because it's the same pitch, it's the same format, and you can use uh, both. So it basically brings me to the end of this section saying we need standardization in the microfluidics industry. But as you can see with these examples, we're certainly not there yet. I'd like to continue with the second part of the webinar to talk about integration of microfluidic functions. There's multiple functions that you can add to, uh, to your microfluidics. Uh, let's just go through them quickly and then I'll come back to some of them uh, in uh, the following slides. Controlled flow, pumping and manifolding, volume metering, mixing of different buffers or reagents, Filtration, for example, used for filtering blood cells, cell and particle sorting, uh, heating and sensing, which is, is commonly done by electrodes if you need some kind of an assay, a PCR based or immuno uh, heating, and wave guiding. And some of these I'll address uh, in more detail. Now let's take an IVD cartridge as an example. So this is a concept that you can see here. And what kind of aspects are relevant if you want to integrate microfluidic functions into this cartridge? First of all, we start with sample preparation. Um, we need uh, functions to prepare the sample uh, for the measurement or the detection. And things like filtration and volumetering become relevant. And I'll go back, uh, I'll come back to that in further detail. We need some kind of flow control, whether it's passive or active, the fluid needs to flow through the device in a controlled way. We need reagents and we need, uh, in most cases, service functionalization to make sure that the biology runs in a proper way and that there's no absorption of materials that you do not want to absorb to the surface, for example. And then finally, we need some kind of sensor or detected which is integrated into your cartridge and actually performs the measurement. Now let's start with sample preparation. Um, I mentioned already filtration is one of the ways to prepare a biological sample like blood. And here is an example shown with just a commercial filter that is integrated into an IVD cartridge, but you could go one step further even by creating a membrane that captures specific cells from the blood, in this case monocytes, where you create a two-layered system uh, with a membrane in between. The membrane uh, basically captures the monocytes by using specific receptor antibody uh, interactions. The plasma is going through the membrane to the bottom side and the red blood cells are just basically filtered out of the solution. So in this way, you end up with the cells that you need for your uh, analysis. Now, uh, other techniques that are relevant for sample preparation are uh, how can we control and quantify the volume of interest? If we use a pipette, for example, you will be able to pipette a specific volume into your device, but it's not accurate enough. If you want to do a quantitative measurement, and that's what we are aiming for with more complex devices, you need also a quantified accurate volume. And for that, you can use volume metering techniques as shown in this example, where a reservoir has a very specific size. And if you get rid of all the excess material by using this kind of capillary forces, as you can see in the movie, you create a very defined volume to uh, enter into your microfluidic cartridge for the uh, measurement. Then there is beads based uh, protocols that can be used for sample prep, quite commonly used to uh, absorb DNA or proteins to your bead service to do washing, uh, lysing, all these kind of aspects that are needed to prepare your sample for the uh, detection. And the nice thing uh, about magnetic approach is that, well, you can manipulate these beads by using magnetic force, uh, magnetic force externally. And this is a very uh, a commonly used technique in this, uh, in this uh, arena. Then a bit more advanced techniques that can be used is uh, if you really look at cells, for example, you can use sorting technologies or concentration technologies by applying different physical fields or using different physical principles to select the cells uh, of interest. 
And here you see a few principles. I'll not go through all of them in detail. The first one is using acoustic forces where you can concentrate a beam of cells going into a specific channel uh, based on size and geometry. And then the last one I'll mention specifically, which is the deterministic lateral displacement, where you're basically using the coin sorter mechanism, as you can see in the animation, to select cells or to sort cells based on their size. In this case, this technology is used, for example, to uh, select uh, red blood cells uh, or white blood cells, I should say, and isolate them from red blood cells, as you can see in the movie. So really, we see a growing need for these kind of advanced functionalities in microfluidic uh, devices. Now let's continue to the second uh, microfluidic function that is really relevant and actually the motor of your microfluidic device. How can you control your flow? There's two ways to do that. Actively, which is shown in this slide, by using integrated valves. Um, and there's many solutions in the industry. I'm just showing you the concepts here. Uh, normally open valves or normally closed valves in which a membrane is either uh, pressed down to close your, uh, your uh, fluidic channel or the membrane has to be opened by applying fluidic pressure to uh, close uh, or to open the valve. And you can see this principle in the movie. You can play with valves and the colors show that you basically create a switch this way and your, your microfluidics can be uh, really controlled. When do you need which reagent or buffer to enter a certain channel? So this technique allows you to control uh, your flow inside uh, the different areas of the microfluidic chip. And here are some examples in practice where the valves are in action. Basically, you can see, you can also use it as a pumping device. Uh, these valves are used typically also in more complex fluid systems uh, for cell culturing and uh, hybrid uh, systems that I'll come back to uh, later in this uh, talk. Then there's a second type of flow control, which is uh, uh, interesting, which is called capillary flow control. So in this case, um, Valves are not being used, but you're using a more, let's say, passive way to control your flow. And it's shown in this, uh, in this movie. Um, this is an example of using electrostatic forces. Uh, so you need electrodes for that. And you can create a capillary stop in your channel. As you can see, uh, the blue liquid stopping at a certain area. And to, uh, to make sure the flow can continue, uh, shown in this next movie, you need to apply an elect electrostatic pulse. And this pulse creates a small electric field, which basically sucks the fluid into the second channel, as you can see uh, in this movie. It's a very nice and uh, delicate principle, because in many cases, for making a microfluidic product, you will need some kind of electrode that does uh, detection or sensing. And these electrodes, as you can see in the chip example here, can also be used to control your flow. Now, on a wafer scale, uh, in terms of production, uh, it looks like this. You have your electrodes on a wafer, you have your vias and channels, and you can really create devices on a wafer scale level. For example, for an immunoassay-based uh, assay, where these kind of actuators are really uh, efficient. Then, looking at reagents and surface functionalization, um, in many cases, especially when you use uh, standard plastics or standard glass uh, substrates, um, if you use biology, you will need to somehow uh, work with surface functionization. And also you need to add uh, some specific biology or reagents to your product because otherwise you cannot run uh, the assay. Now there's different principles there. If we look at reagents integration, you could add a pouch, for example, on your cartridge, but you could also do things like biospotting of lyophilized reagents inside your chip that are then uh, solved um, in your uh, buffer solution or reagent uh, solution when the test is being uh, executed. Uh, looking at surface coatings, for example, this is a, a nice example coming from, uh, from Surfix, a surface functionization company. Uh, you can play with the wettability of your surface. You can even create hydrophobic stops, as you can see in, in the movie playing where you add a fluorinated coating to stop your flow at a specific point, which can then only be activated again if you push it through that barrier. And in this way, you can also yeah, play with your surface chemistry inside your chip. Then last but not least, uh, some examples of hybrid assembly, and uh, I'll come back to that uh, later. Uh, as I mentioned before, sensor integration is really key because at the end, if you've prepared your sample and you've been able to wash it and to prepare it for the test, 
you need some kind of detector or sensor that actually does the measurement. And in many cases, this is a sensor uh, coming from the industry, from the semicon industry, it either being a CMOS part or, or some kind of CCD detector, uh, an optical sensor. Uh, here are just some examples. Uh, we've been working with FET sensors. We've been working with uh, gamma luminescence uh, based sensors. So there's quite some examples there in the market. And uh, some of them I'll, I'll show at the end of the talk when I talk about the, the examples of hybrid solutions. Um, for example, the, uh, the the electronic nose, where we basically have multiple electronic uh, or silicon chips mounted onto uh, a surface. Now, finally, uh, one of the microfluidic functions that is also of interest uh, um, and and is growing in, in in the market as well is if you uh, integrate uh, waveguides, optical waveguides, inside your microfluidic chip. And this slide shows the principle of that. So we have our microfabrication of, of a layer of glass, for example, and you can add an additional layer with a grating and a waveguide that enables you to look at the surface uh, selectively. Now, the nice advantage of using this waveguiding technology as a detection method is that you decouple the excitation from the fluorescence detection. So we have a laser beam coming from the bottom that goes to the planner surface of the device and is, is, is uh, exiting at the other side using this grading technology and then we have the fluorescent detection of the uh, let's say the antibody reaction that is coming from the top and in this way you can nicely decouple it another advantage is that you only address the analytes that have been bound on the surface so it's really a very surface sensitive technique and you don't need any labeling for that but uh, it's also good to note but this accounts for all the technologies out there uh, for detection you need selective binding chemistry to make sure that you immobilize the right analytes that you want to, uh, to look at and not uh, have non-specific or non-selective absorption. So waveguiding, as said, is a nice label-free detection method uh, for drug discovery applications, for example. Now, this brings me to the next section, which is hybrid bonding technologies. What kind of bo bonding technologies do we actually need uh, to, be, to be able to make our hybrid devices? Uh, I've mentioned uh, five groups of bonding technologies. I'll only address a few in the, in the following slides. But if we start from, uh, from the bottom, low temperature, room temperature bonding by means of laser uh, assisted bonding or by using UV adhesives, for example. Then we have techniques that are more lithography based like patternable adhesive bonding. And if you raise the temperature further, uh, commonly used techniques also in the semicon industry, especially making MEMS devices, uh, anodic bonding uh, of glass to silicon and glass to metal, and fusion bonding is a commonly used technique if you want to directly bond two surfaces together, but it has the drawback of using very high temperatures. So all these technologies, uh, hybrid bonding technologies, can be used to bond one type of material to another type of material. Now, lasers, uh, here's uh, some more detail on that. Uh, why is this of interest? The nice thing about using a laser is that you only need a local seal and that the rest of the, the chip is basically untouched. So you can be very accurate in sealing off the areas that you need to seal off without affecting, for example, the biology that is, into, uh, that is inside the chip. It's also a, a, a method creating a high bond strength, uh, even such that it creates hermeticity, as you can see in the, in the picture where uh, basically a, a droplet of water or a liquid is inside this, this lens and you can see the void uh, still there to prove that there's actually liquid encapsulated uh, inside this uh, device by just using laser sealing. So it's a nice technique also for uh, sensitive components and biomaterials. Then another room temperature technique uh, quite commonly used is uh, UV adhesives but you need to use a technique called transfer bonding to be able to apply those adhesives to your surface and that's explained in this slide. Um, the roll-on principle takes care of basically uh, transferring as it's called a very thin layer of adhesive to the areas that need to be bonded but as you can see in the schematic the areas that uh, basically form the fluidic channels are not uh, 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 covered with adhesive so it's a nice way of selectively covering the bonding areas and using UV light to uh, bond your surfaces together. And these can be different surfaces. And at the end, you, re you have a nice result, as you can see in the SEM picture, only with a very thin layer, uh, thin layer of adhesive uh, present. So there's biocompatible solutions there. Uh, and as I said, the advantage is 
that you uh, uh, can create uh, or bond different materials uh, and be biocompatible. Then we look at uh, techniques like patentable adhesive bonding. Um, we see that uh, there's uh, materials in the market uh, like dry film resist, which enable to use lithography-based processes, not for using the resist as a masking material, but for using the resist as a spacer, a microfluidic spacer. And that's what's shown in this picture, where basically you laminate this material on top of your device. It's a dry material, so there's no liquids involved, and you can pattern it by using standard lithography techniques. Uh, you do need elevated temperature around 100 and 150 degrees, but this is still very much applicable to MEMS and CMOS solutions, for example. And that's also where we see that this type of bonding technology is used, as you can see in the, in the pictures uh, in the bottom. Another advantage of this technique is that it can be applied on a wafer, uh, wafer scale. And how does it look schematically? So we have a capping wafer that we can microstructure in this case. We apply by lamination this dry film resist layer. This is then being lithographically processed to make sure that only the areas uh, of bonding uh, have this uh, patterned adhesive. That's why it's called patternable adhesive. And then you can bond it to any other material, for example, in this case, a polymeric lens, which is made out of plastic, and you can seal those together at elevated temperature. So what is the advantage here? By using a dry film of a specific thickness, you can really tune the optical design, in this case, of this, of this lens, because you know exactly what thickness you will be bonding to, and you can play with these uh, properties uh, in an accurate way. And this is then the result. Typically, as I said, I, you can do this on a wafer scale, 200 millimeter wafer containing a lot of these lenses. And the right pictures show some microscopy uh, pictures of how it looks like uh, in a close up. And also, here you create a firm bond uh, to, to uh, protect the camera uh, from the outside. Now, a last technique uh, I mentioned are. Uh, is a bonding technology called anodic bonding. I think that's more commonly known in the, in the semicon industry, especially uh, we're looking at MEMS devices. The drawback there is you need temperatures up to 350, 400 degrees, uh, and you need some pressure to be able to have those uh, wafers uh, into molecular contact. But it's a commonly used technique and it's CMOS uh, compatible. So it gives you, allows you to bond an optical surface like glass to a silicon wafer process surface. Um, and create a, a, an optical uh, MEMS device. That brings me to the final section of, of the webinar uh, to show you uh, three examples of how these bonding technologies end up in, in a product, in a solution. And some of the pictures you've seen already, but I'd like to, to address it in a, a bit further detail. So here you see a, a device that is used as a smart cell culturing platform for cardiomyocytes, basically heart cells. And the nice thing, uh, and also the reason why I show this example, is that here all the hybrid bonding technologies and materials come together in one device. If you look at the schematics, you basically start with a, a MIA chip, a multi-electrode uh, array chip, that is mounted onto a PCB with standard techniques. It can be wire bonded, and then after it's, it's, it's being encapsulated, you can also integrate a glass layer, which is the optical interface and the fluidic interface towards the cartridge that you put on top. So there's a glass layer in between that takes care of the interfacing between the MIA chip and your plastic cartridge. And then a standardized molded plastic cartridge can be mounted, which can be, for example, a 96 well plate format commonly used in that industry. And you can take care of your entire microfluidic structure, make sure that all your reagents and your buffers can, and samples can enter uh, that uh, micro titer plate and are accessed uh, or basically pointed towards the MIA chip in the center, as you can see in the infrastructure at the bottom picture. And that's, of course, where the magic happens. Uh, cells can be, can be manipulated, can be detected uh, on the multi-electrode array. But really, this device enables uh, an automated way of analyzing these kind of uh, cells without any manual intervention, except for the fact that we need to, to pipette the sample, which can also be done uh, by an automated robot. And these are typically uh, examples that, uh, that the microfluidic industry is now collaborating also with the semicon industry, uh, IMAC being, being involved. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a good way of showing that hybrids uh, really uh, are possible technology-wise. 
The second example uh, is looking at point of care. Uh, if we would like to design an immunoassay based assay to detect cardiac biomarkers, for example, troponin, uh, you need a number of steps that I've already addressed a little bit uh, in one of the previous uh, uh, sections. Uh, you need to work with reagents and mobilization. Uh, you need to work with uh, various rinsing steps. So if you consider an assay like an ELISA, which is, is commonly uh, used in this, uh, in this field of immunoassays, if you can bring all these functions together, you can create a, a real product that looks like this, uh, where the sensor, in this case, uh, a, um, a CCD detector coming from Anitoa, is um, centered into the microfluidic chip and can detect very small volumes of these cardiac biomarkers in the range of a few nanograms per milliliter, as you can see in the graph. And the sensor lights up because it's a gamma luminescent reaction and it uh, basically transfer, transfers the light signal into an electronic sig signal through the CCD detector, uh, which al allows you to measure a very sensitive concentrations of these biomarkers that are usually present in the blood in very low concentrations and are indications of, let's say, early phase uh, heart failure. Then a last example, um, the electronic nose, uh, now shown in a bit more detail. I've, I've, I've shown one of the pictures already uh, before. How does this work? Well, basically also here, you see that different technologies are coming together. In this case, we have a sensor chip made out of silicon. Uh, that you can see blown up in the picture at the left. And this sensor chip contains a, a nanoparticle based uh, sensing technology and it needs to be somehow connected to a microfluidic circuit. And that's what you see in the cross section at the bottom. We have uh, a microfluidic chip that has uh, surface electrodes on top of it. It has the full infrastructure and it is accessing the sensor chip in the specific areas where uh, an opening is created. And now to make sure that the chip interacts properly with the, uh, the microfluidic infrastructure, you need to electrically uh, interconnect and fluidically interconnect the sensor chip with your microfluidic uh, uh, glass chip. And that's uh, done by using techniques like flip chip bonding, underfilling, commonly uh, known in the industry. And in this way, your electronics is directly connected and interacting with your fluidics, as you can see uh, in, the, in the cross section. Now, this allows you to, to mount multiple of these sensors onto one device that are all electronically connected to the I.O. pads at the uh, perimeter of the chip and you create a, a fully autonomous sensor uh, which can be mounted into um, um, an analyte, uh, an analysis tool, sorry, and in this case it's used for uh, analyzing exhale breath uh, to detect lung cancer, early phase lung cancer uh, with patients, uh, that, for example, that uh, patients that are smoking that want to know whether they are developing something. So it's a way of very sensibly measuring um, uh, biomarkers uh, from breath uh, by using this technology. And it's been uh, a part of a project that we uh, did a few years ago together with the industry and, and the academia. And it's created this, uh, these kind of uh, solutions. So with that, I would like to uh, summarize uh, the webinar coming to the end. Um, uh, let's say a um, lot of topics discussed. Uh, I would like to, uh, to give you three, let's say, takeaway messages. Uh, one being that microfluidic interstand, uh, interfacing standards are relevant for speeding up product innovation and commercialization. Secondly, we see that integration of microfluidic functions and the use of hybrid bonding technologies are both essential elements if you want to enable lab workflow automation in diagnostics and life science applications. And lastly, Combining, and that's actually what I started with in the introduction, combining the worlds of microfluidics and MEMS will create advanced systems in the lab on a chip field. And this will enable us to develop products with a higher value. With that, I would like to conclude this webinar and give the word back to Reed for the Q&A ses session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very instructive uh, overview. Let's now indeed continue with a few more questions. Um, when asking to all previous speakers, I'd like to pose the same question to you too. Uh, and you already did touch upon it during the, uh, the presentation, but could you please repeat your vision on what are, according to you, the main bottlenecks to be solved for a further growth of microfluidic devices and more market share? 
Thank you, Reed. Uh, indeed, th this is a good and relevant question, and I briefly touched upon it uh, during the uh, webinar. Uh, what we see happening in, in, in microfluidics product development is that, uh, on one hand, uh, because uh, there is a lack of standardization, all companies come with their own customized solution. And if this solution uh, does not result in a technically feasible product, then basically the product development uh, stops and uh, there is no alternatives uh, available. Uh, but secondly, and maybe as important, is that uh, the, the, the main challenge uh, we see and also a bottleneck is uh, making a feasible prototype that works uh, based on technology that is out there because there is many technologies that are offered to today. Uh, we, we enter into a phase of product development where we see it's feasible and we have a proof of concept. And yeah, uh, companies become enthusiastic and then they want, want to invest to really make it into a product. And that's the critical phase, validating the product, replicating it uh, in a reliable way, in a reproducible way, and making sure that the, the product is yeah, doing every time the same thing. Uh, that's really a challenge uh, to hit the market. And we see also that in that phase, many of the, the startup companies that have a new technology that they want to, to transfer into a product, that's where basically um, uh, they find uh, yeah, uh, the challenge and sometimes even have to stop because of investment uh, uh, issues. So I would consider that to be uh, the challenge here. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for your view on, on these uh, main challenges. Another interesting question, which is uh, related to, to your response, is the following. Uh, for standardization, uh, what are the challenges in agreeing on specific formats? Because I can imagine that each company tries to push its own vision and technology. True, uh, that's that's indeed the case, and that's why we need a, a consortia like the Microfluidics Association, where companies sit together and talk about uh, the consensus. So, indeed, consensus is a key word here if you want to standardize each company offering their own solution. Uh, and I think we've made some good steps there if you look at what kind of things uh, can be standardized uh, and can be agreed upon between different companies. For example, if you look at interfacing, um, what about your uh, grid size and your pitch? So how much distance does a multi-connector uh, need to have in between the individual connect, uh, connect, uh, connectors so it's uh, interoperable? Uh, just as an example, um, uh, if, we, if a customer of ours or a customer of, of some other microfluidic company would like to develop a chip and they say, okay, can we use this or that connector? We need to make sure that using the right pitch in the right format helps in providing that customer with multiple solutions rather than just only a solution that we can provide. And I think that's the first step in the standardization. Start small, make sure that interfacing of chips uh, becomes interoperable and thus a customer is more flexible in ordering parts from various companies. Okay, so it's indeed clear that uh, collaboration between different companies will help us all to, to move forward. Uh, yes, bring yes. Uh, technology further. So then one last question. It was also asked during the previous webinar and I will probably ask it again next week is how does glass compares to polymers in terms of cost and performance? Yes, that's a, that's a very interesting one, especially for a company uh, working with glass devices as well as polymer devices. Um, exactly. the, the, this is a question often raised, of course, by our customers. Uh, the, the traditional answer would be, well, uh, glass is more high end and it's more expensive and polymers are used for consumables and high volumes. Well, this is true uh, to a part. Um, it depends a lot on the application. If you have a specific application where you need to integrate different functionalities, some of that I've already shown, it's simply not possible to use either glass or polymer. So then the material choice is really driven by the application less than by the cost. Um, if you look at volumes, typically glass-based devices can be made on a wafer scale up to the ten thousands, hundred thousands of parts per year easily. But if we talk about a low um, uh, cost, high volume plastic consumable that needs to be run into the millions, then it's much more obvious uh, to choose for a plastic solution. So I would say um, it's not only about the cost, it's really about the application. What kind of functionality do you need? Uh, do you need a, a optical and thermal performance? Then it's more obvious to go for glass. Do you need a consumable that you'll be able to replicate in high volumes 
uh, for a, a point of care device, then it's much more obvious to choose for a polymer solution. And I think what is key is that when a customer comes uh, to start to develop their product, that they try to answer that question up front. What do we actually need for our application and what options do we have? Or does it need to be a hybrid solution, for example? That's what I would like to yeah, say about uh, this choice between glass and polymers. Okay, thanks, Mark. And I believe that aligns well with what was said before as well. And I'm, of course, also curious to hear the response after the next session, which will be on polymer based microfluidics. So, with this, I'd like to end this session and I'd like to thank you again, Mark, for this great presentation. And thank you all for participating participating to these webinars on microfluidics and looking forward to meet you again next week, the 17th of June, in which polymer based microfluidic consumables for life science applications will be tackled by Holger Becker from Microfluidic Ship Shop. See you then. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.